you're experiencing into the chat box. We will be monitoring both throughout the webinar, but we will we'll be looking primarily at the Q&A box for questions during the Q&A portions. Additionally, this webinar is being recorded again, um, and I'll be sending out a link early next week. You may have noticed the closed captioning transcription at the bottom of our screen. In the spirit of inclusivity, we will be using this feature in Zoom for all of our webinars going forward. If you'd like to view and read the full log of the transcription, please look at the bottom of your screen and click on the far right option, view transcription. The second option of the menu that will appear is view full transcription. This will bring up a dialogue bar on the right side of your screen with a log. Okay, I will now turn it over to Karen Johnson, Director of Performance Improvement and Innovation with the Washington Health Alliance to quickly walk us through our learning objectives and then do a little level setting around what we mean when we say interoperability. Thanks so much, Amy, really appreciate it. I echo your appreci her appreciation for all of you being here today. You know, so often when we use words like interoperability, our eyes sort of glaze over. So um, really gratifying to know that so many are interested in this as an important accelerator for change or um, value-based success. So that's really what we're really focused on today. And I'm gonna just review what we're hoping to accomplish in the 90 minutes that we have with you, describe the roadmap of how we've laid that out, and then do just a little bit of a level set as, as um, Amy said, because this is a pretty broad topic, we can take it a lot of diff different directions. So our main objective is to really just have some sort of shared understanding of what interoperability means to value-based adoption and success. We wanna really orient our thinking toward patient-centric versus organizational specific solutions. We know many of you are working hard within your organizations on initiatives related to interoperability, whether that's around compliance or whether that's around the business need. Um, we wanna always make sure that we're sort of looking up and out the window occasionally and thinking about the patients that we're all serving. Um, and all of these webinars are really centered around identifying pathways to success. So how do we all, um, whether we are a provider, health plan, purchaser, or other key healthcare stakeholder, how do we all contribute to meaningful change? And in terms of organizing today, we're gonna to bring you some sort of a national and state perspective at the beginning. We've got Julia Adler-Milstein, um, professor, and Dr. Julia Adler-Milstein, professor of medicine and director of the Center for Clinical Informatics and Improvement Research from UCSF, who's gonna give us sort of that really broad view. I'll tell you a little bit more about her in just a few minutes. And then Kathy Ott and Vishal Chaudhry, both who play key roles in this area at the State Health Authority, Healthcare Authority. Um, Kathy serving as the IT Strategic Advisor and Vishal as the Chief Data Officer are going to have a conversation with us about what's happening there and their view on this. And then we're gonna have a really, I think, um, meaningful and important boots on the ground discussion. It's gonna be led by Elia Prostowski, who is the executive director of the Royal Collaborative. And truth be told, she's the one who gave us the tagline of um, when we asked her to do this, she said, you mean, do, why don't we all just talk to each other? Um, so we thought that was sort of a, she, we got the right person for the right conversation. Um, joining her is Jeremiah Bernhardt, Dr. Jeremiah Bernhardt, who is a family physician with I Iora Health. He just, he has a great perspective. He just recently joined Iora within like the last two weeks from Swedish. And he also um, has been central to leadership among family physicians in Washington state as a former president of the Washington Academy of Family Physicians. And and currently serves on their primary care investment task force. So great perspective there. And then really truly boots in the ground on this topic is Randy Coughlin, who is director of population health at Embright, a clinically integrated network whose sole purpose in all of this is really figuring how do we connect providers and do really good care for individuals and populations. So with that in mind, I'm just gonna say a little bit about interoperability as it relates to value-based success. So um, what do we mean when we say interoperability? We like this um, definition from HIMSS, which is the ability of health information systems to work together within and across organizational boundaries in order to advance the effective delivery of healthcare for individuals and populations. A lot of definitions out there. We like this one because it highlights individuals and populations which are central to value-based success. Um, also, I think it talks about working within organizations, which is really important, but also working across organizations. And this is where that patient-centric view of the world, I think, comes into play, because as patients, we have the ability to go a lot of different places for care, and we often do. 
So how well are we doing? Well, the guy that wrote this article for Forbes didn't think so well. Um, he called the lack of healthcare data sharing, quote, a medical tragedy of underappreciated dimension. Now, to be fair, I've been using this for a while and it's from 2015 and are we making progress? Well, um, for sure we are, but I think the question we are asking today is whether interoperability is acting as an accelerator for change toward value-based success. And fortunately, thanks to the healthcare authority and the paying for value survey of providers and health plans that they do each year, we have the ability to answer that question. Um, when asked to identify the most important enablers of value-based adoption, both providers and health plans cite important in aspects of interoperability as you see here. And while you may have guessed it, um, providers and health plans also report in the same survey that these important enablers um, currently represent obstacles to progress. So these are the things that we're here to talk about. And when you bring sort of interoperability and value-based success together, and we had a lot of conversations leading up to today with lots of different per folks from different perspectives, including our speakers, but beyond that as well, you know, we heard these two things. Interoperability is important to value-based success from the perspective of really delivering great care for individuals and populations but also for measuring success. So just to level set a little bit, we're really focused on optimizing care and the role that interoperability plays in that. We know there's an element of interoperability that's important to getting complete information to really measure success under value-based contracts, but just a little bit of a commercial here, come back on July 15th when we get into that. So if the end game is value-based success, the first step is really adoption and progress across the continuum of value. So what you see here is a representation of the many different alternative or many different payment models that exist today with fee-for-service all the way at the far left and capitation at the far right. Um, these pretty much align with the alternative payment model categories one through four is designed by, defined by CMS and their Learning and Action Network framework, widely used throughout the country, including here in Washington State. And so one of the challenges I think we're all quite familiar with is, is that many of the value-based payment models are built on a fee-for-service foundation, and the dollars associated with those payments continue to be relatively small. And I think as you look at this, you have to think about what are those underlying incentives. And we know well the incentives for fee-for-service is really focused on filling appointments, maximizing time with patients. Whereas when you introduce these new models, all of a sudden we have these attributed populations that we are paying attention to, thinking about population health, where we're really focused on things like coordinating care, managing referrals, closing gaps in care, and addressing social determinants of health. And these are functions that frankly are new in a lot of care settings. And one of the things that's really sort of in, in that is distinctive about this as it relates to uh, value-based success is that many of these activities occur for patients that aren't in the office. And so many of our systems and functions and workflows are built around the patient being there with us. So digging into that just a little bit about this, I call this, this is sort of the how a bill becomes a law version of how interoperability works in a care setting. So if we all lived in bubbles and we all got our care from one place or with even within one system, you know, all of our information is likely right there in their shiny EMR and um, everything works beautifully, but we don't live in bubbles. And as patients, as I said, particularly in markets like ours, where if we have insurance coverage and thank um, goodness for Washington State's um, great, robust Medicaid and exchange programs, we have 94% of us with insurance in the state of Washington. It's mostly a PPO. Um, environment. So we have freedom to go wherever we want, and we typically do. So that means in order for that, that provider who's looking at me in the care setting to have full information on me, um, they need to get that information from a lot of different sources. And it gets even a little more complicated when you talk about it, optimizing care for populations, because that's, again, those patients that you don't see. And all of a sudden, the care setting is replaced with the population health dashboard and the analytics. And again, I still need all those sources of information if I really want that sort of comprehensive view of the patient that the provider site as so important as an enabler of value-based success. So that's sort of where we're focused today and where we really want to orient the thinking. And uh, we're going to stop now and um, spend a, a little bit of time, more time getting your thoughts on this. So we want to know what do you think. So Amy's going to launch a poll 
And we're going to ask you, um, what do you see as the most significant barrier to interoperability? The financial incentives are not significant enough to motivate change, that you're just not interested in exchanging information with competitors, that it's too hard to incorporate inbound information into systems and workflows, too expensive to make the necessary changes, that the information you're getting isn't really that meaningful, so why bother? Or maybe there's something else that you wanna type in the chat. So as you are answering the poll, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about our friend, Julia, as soon as I find her bio here. Hi, Julia, thank you for joining us. So I first became acquainted with, acquainted with, first heard Dr. Milstein, Adler Milstein speak at, um, in DC at Health Data Palooza, which tells you a little bit about my background. Um, it was a couple years ago when some of the federal rules were just being announced and um, Julie was speaking with the Bipartisan Policy Council that had done a uh, really, I think, still meaningful white paper on that topic. Um, her research is used by researchers, health systems and policymakers around, she identifies obstacles to progress and ways to overcome them, which is why she's here today. She's published over 125 influential papers, testified before the US Senate Health, Education, Labor and Pension Committees, a member of the National Academy of Medicine, and it's been named one of the top 10 influential women in health IT. And um, she's also sought after, in fact, one of our regional plans has engaged Julia as an advisor to one of their new initiatives. So I'm going to um, turn to Amy to say, how are we doing on the poll? Looks good. We have some really good additional other comments in the chat. So I really encourage everyone to take a look at those. We will be looking at that as Julia is speaking and hope to incorporate all your thinking and thoughts into our Q&A with her. And as soon as you're ready to land that poll, Amy. Yeah, I think it looks like the responses have slowed down. So I'm going to end it in five seconds. So everyone get your final answers in. Okay. So the number one answer, financial incentives are not significant enough to motivate change. With a close second around too hard to incorporate inbound information into our systems and workflows. And Julia's nodding her head and we're gonna take that down and look forward to hearing from Julia. Great, Great. well. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, and I just was sort of reflecting on, uh, Karen, your, your perfect setup to my talk and thinking about how, um, you know, it's really, it, to make progress in interoperability requires uh, coordination and collaboration among the key stakeholders. So conversations like these are just so critical uh, to moving the ball forward. Um, so I'm just really happy to be here today and happy to see that um, in the state of Washington, you are having these, uh, these conversations. Um, I'm also really struck by the chat and then just sort of uh, all of the responses to the question. And I think it just, it illustrates uh, again, you know, why progress has felt slow. Um, and it's because interoperability, successful interoperability requires tackling such a wide range of, of areas and barriers. Um, and so I, you know, if it was just a matter of, you know, getting the, the, the technical integration right, or just a matter of getting the financial incentives right, or, you know, any one area, you know, we could certainly move more quickly, uh, but we're really trying to tackle all of these areas at once. Um, and, and again, that's just, that's such a massive task. Um, and, and again, why, you know, this, the conversations like these are needed to, to make sure that we're level setting, seeing all the barriers and making sure that we're, we're making progress across all of them. Um, so my talk today is uh, intended to be just a, a level set, sort of how to think about uh, what's happening um, across these different areas, but with a real focus on, of course, uh, value-based payment success and how emerging technologies, business models, and policies could help speed us towards interoperability uh, that helps meet the needs of, uh, of, of value-based models. So next slide. So I often start with this um, because uh, uh, even though we had a definition of interoperability, I think anyone who's uh, worked anywhere uh, near it knows that it's, it's an easy word to throw off, interoperability, are you interoperable? But it's actually very hard to understand what that really means in practice. Um, and so I, I've, I've started to use this slide because I think if someone says we are interoperable, you really have to say, okay, well, I need to know three more things, at least three more things. I need to know the what. What information are you talking about is interoperable? Are you talking about an entire set of information about a patient that, that relates to their health and medical care status? Um, there's notions of this in, in some of our regulations of the you know, entire set of, of information about a patient. It is vast. 
Um, and I think no one has really uh, made progress on, on interoperability at that uh, scope of, of, of breadth. Um, there's the notion of a legal medical record, which is a more constrained set of medical information that you know, would be held by a healthcare provider. Um, and, and certainly that is more manageable, but again, uh, very few places that have really figured out how to get an entire legal medical record to be interoperable. Um, summary care record and um, interoperability around single types of data like test results, admission, discharge, transfer notifications. That's where really we've seen, uh, I, I think, the most progress over the past decade, where we've identified a set of information um, that, that's a summary and figured out how to, how to move that around. So again, we need some di discussion of the what, and I think some of the frustration with progress is the fact that in summary care records, we often don't have the most valuable types of information like clinical notes um, or an you know, enti entire list of encounters. Um, and so I think some of, uh, some of this question of, of where we need to make progress is expanding the what. Um, and then there's also the how, this is, came up in the chat, right? So how is that information being moved around? Um, are we talking about a truly fully integrated uh, set of data uh, that takes data wherever it may exist outside of the local uh, information system and brings it in in a way that is, um, uh, you know, what we would call, you know, technical semantic interoperability at the data, individual data element level. Um, so that if I have a set of uh, lab results and I'm getting a set of lab results from outside of my organization, th those seamlessly integrate into a single set of lab test results. I think that we're nowhere near that right now. Uh, and again, I think that was one of the specific barriers that was often cited is that information, we're just not at a point of semantic standardization that allows that full, full level of integration. And really it's what frontline users want because if you don't have that, you're constantly looking at multiple sources of information and requiring humans uh, to think about how do I put all this information together into a cohesive picture of an individual or a population. More often what we have is, is that data is available perhaps as a document or as some other type of sort of parsable set of, of, of text, but not, not individual data elements. It exists within an information system. So you can go to a tab within your EHR and see outside information um, or by a single sign on, you can like, um, you know, uh, be able to port into a community health record that exists outside of your EHR, uh, but it's still easier to get to it. Um, and we also still have a lot of just Portal, portal views into data sources from outside records. And, and people debate, like, is that interoperability or not? I put it on because it's still widely used and it still gives electronic access to outside information. Um, but again, I think no one feels like that's really the end point. Um, so that's the how piece. And then last but not least, certainly is the who. So who is providing that data um, and who is sharing? Uh, and again, I think especially for value-based care, but, but really for any you know, clinician, they really want to be able to see a full spectrum of information from post-acute care, mental and behavioral uh, health providers, uh, payer data has really important breadth uh, that, that, that needs to be integrated, uh, EMS, community, social services, again, the list goes on. Um, and so I often get asked, like, is there anywhere that's gotten it right? Um, and, and I have not seen any uh, uh, community that's really done sort of what I think of as like the, the top line in each of these that's figured out how to include all stakeholders and all their data, really integrated it in a seamless to use way um, and, and, and really been able to pull together sort of like a full picture of all types of data that might be relevant. Um, so instead, what you see on the WHO is usually like a clinically integrated network. There's a set of providers, you know, who have been identified, and then there's um, efforts to, you know, to, to integrate information among, you know, that set of, of core providers. Uh, we obviously see as we look across the country, uh, lots of different ways to, to cut, uh, you know, who gets to exchange information, their health information exchanges or HIOs that exist, about 100 or so of them across the country that bring together providers in a given geographic region. Um, obviously, we know that the EHR vendors are active here in setting up networks that allow those that are on their EHRs to exchange information. I mean, Care Everywhere is really just, a, in, in some ways, an incredible resource in terms of what they've been able to do to connect up um, sites on Epic. But we know that patients go many places other than sites on Epic to get their care. So that's not going to be our, our national solution. Um, and then certainly we're also seeing network of network connectivity. Um, I'll touch on that a little bit at, at the end of my talk as I get into TAPCA. So I spend the most time on this slide because again, I think it gives us this real picture of on the one hand, how we are making progress. Um, and I'd say, you know, for a long time, we were sort of at the bottom of, of my list. And I think we're sort of slowly moving our way up, but we're also nowhere near the top of the list in any one of these categories. And so that's the real gap uh, that we have to think about today is, is sort of, you know, how do we want to move up 
um, and, and what are the key levers to get us there. Next slide. So because this topic is specifically about um, uh, value-based uh, payment models and value-based successes, I just wanted to highlight that I do think that that helps bring some interoperability use cases into focus. Um, and in places that have taken off with value-based care, we've certainly seen that they've disproportionately invested in some types of interoperability. Um, and so ADT notifications is, is probably the, the, the first and foremost that's on the list um, because the ability to know where patients are being seen um, is critical for, for success under any value-based model. So we've seen a real investment and in growth in that, and we've seen that then um, adopted into uh, some of the more recent regulations where that's now a requirement. Um, so, so that's been one of the areas that's really taken off. And again, if we just defined interoperability as ADT notification, I think we'd all feel like, yep, we're pretty much there. So for that one interoperability use case, we've made, we've made a huge amount of progress. Care gap notifications, another one, especially when you're combining payer data and clinical data, um, that's another sort of interoperability use case where, where we've made a lot of progress that's been spurred by value-based payment. Um, and I think uh, in some of other, in some of the WHO uh, categories, we've seen uh, you know, more inclusion of post-acute care providers, especially for bundled payment, where that acute post-acute care transition is so critical, payer engagement, et cetera. So I do think that there are ways when we talk about interoperability and, and, and value-based um, payment that we see that it helps uh, decide what types of interoperability use cases to pursue. Next slide. So there's a lot out there that's happening right now in this space, um, and we're going about uh, uh, interoperability in so many different ways. I think this is a really useful slide that I stole from a colleague um, that, that sort of lays out these two axes in terms of the geographic scope. Is it the solution focused on local community, regional, national? There are a lot of entities that are conveners, a lot of entities that are working just on the data standards we need for interoperability. Um, and then um, on, on the y-axis, uh, you know, people who are just building the data pipes, things that just move data from point A to point B, um, and then uh, sort of moving up one level, you know, the data aggregators who are really trying to put the data together in a more meaningful and usable way. Um, and then all the way up at the top, sort of a much more full service um, piece that not only aggregates uh, and, and sort of cleans up the data, but also then applies analytics on top to, for example, identify the care gaps. Um, and obviously for value-based payment, you know, that is really what you need. Um, and so, so that's, um, anyway, just sort of a way to perhaps think about uh, this spectrum and, and where, uh, you know, where, where a group like this might want to be headed. Next slide. So I think despite the fact that the vision is coming into focus, that we're making progress on some um, basic uh, interoperability use cases, uh, I think we all can still see that there are large gaps in needed connectivity. Um, and, and one of the ways that, that in my own research we try to show this is, is that um, you know, across the country, if you ask any given hospital, like, are you interoperable? Are you sending and receiving data electronically? Like they say yes. But what we wanted to say is not just are you doing it, but are you doing it with the other hospital or health system in your market with whom you share the highest volume of patients? That's ultimately what matters. We want connectivity to exist where patients are going to get their care. Um, and, and perhaps not surprisingly, what we found is that the numbers looked much less good when we asked the question like that. Um, and so again, this, this was a survey where we named a specific other health system in that provider's market and said, are you exchanging with this particular uh, uh, individual uh, hospital or health system? Um, and there we found that 63% said that they are not or only a little bit interoperable with them compared to only 21% that said that they were largely or fully interoperable. Um, and then we said, when you think about how you share with them compared to others, you know, how would you compare that? And 23% and of them said, we don't share as well with this high volume partner compared to others. And 48% said the same, we actually don't even differentiate despite the fact that that's such a key partner. Um, perhaps the most interesting results from this study, um, Karen, if you just hit the next button, uh, we asked at the end, is there anything else you'd like to share with us? Um, and these were, again, just completely unsolicited uh, comments. Um, uh, you know, I took the survey, but you referenced our direct competitor across town with whom we rarely share. Uh, you know, data because we're competitors. Someone else said very competitive relationship, they're our chief competitor. So again, that was in some ways the whole point of the surveys. We named their biggest competitor. And then we said, how are you sharing information with them? So, you know, I, I do think value-based care nudges us away from uh, the, the, the notion of, of competition as a barrier, but we are clearly not uh, in that world yet where, where competitive uh, relationships don't matter. So I think that that's a huge barrier that we do need to tackle. But I will say that even when uh, we've seen that connectivity exists, we have this sort of interesting last mile almost problem where, where we see that the data isn't used. 
So among hospitals that report that they are interoperable, 34% report that they're rarely or never using that outside data, um, which at first seems very puzzling, but, but when we asked why, they said exactly some of the barriers that you cited. It's difficult to integrate information into the EHR. It's not always available when needed. It's not presented in a useful format. So we can put all of our eggs in the, you know, getting everyone wired up basket. Um, but we can't assume that that's going to get us at the end of the day to where we need to be, um, because we really do have to think about that final step where we get that information integrated in someone's workflow in a place where it's easy to use and make sense, um, because uh, that's what's really going to change a decision and allow a provider or a population health manager to really understand what's going on and improve their, their decision making uh, that takes advantage of that data. So again, it's, I think another really critical piece to keep in mind. Next slide. So uh, this is again, another framework. I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, but just again, this alignment that needs to be in place if we're gonna make progress on interoperability, we have to get the sort of the policies, the standards, the services, technologies, business models, et cetera, aligned. Um, uh, and that sort of uh, making sure that the conditions are right. Uh, then we need to have those structural capabilities that move information around where it needs to be. Uh, the organizational processes that make sure that again, that information is showing up uh, in front of the right person at the right time. Um, and then again, ultimately a decision maker needs to be able to uh, understand and think about that information in the context of a decision they're making. Um, and, uh, and it's only then that we can expect that the outcomes that we're all trying to move will be improved. Next slide. So um, what might help here? Um, so again, just gonna go quickly through some areas. Um, there's a lot that's happening in this space, a lot that's changing. I don't think it's um, clear exactly what, whether we're gonna have sort of one of these be you know, the, the holy grail or not. Um, but, but there is a lot that's happening. And so I just want to summarize those. So as you're having your conversations, you sort of have a sense of, of, of what's on, uh, what's, what's sort of currently uh, in play. So with respect to technology advances, um, uh, we'll to just talk very briefly about APIs and FHIR. They're you know, part of what's in the new regulations uh, that just really went into um, effect. Uh, I mean, they've really just been passed over the past few years and are going to sort of slowly kick in over the next few years. Um, as well as bulk data export, which is so critical for pop health. So not just pulling a single patient's record out of the EHR, but being able to pull data uh, across a set of patients. I'm um, gonna talk briefly about business models uh, that are aligned to incentivize interoperability, though frankly, there's not as much happening there as I wish. Um, and then you know, a whole host of new policy efforts. I'm just gonna briefly touch on, on TEFCA because that's really the framework that will hopefully get us from sort of individual network connectivity to network to network connectivity. So next slide. So, um, you know, on the technology front, again, there's so, so much going on. There's so many different players. I think it does quickly get, get overwhelming um, in terms of how to think about these. Um, so, so, you know, roughly speaking, I think you can group them uh, as, um, as sort of, you know, what is the approach to interoperability that they support? Um, are they more of a push model? Are they more of a pull or query model? Um, are they really investing in APIs as sort of the new way of, of, of pulling and working with data? Um, or uh, increasingly we're seeing you know, uh, new companies that are really treating interoperability as a service. So again, there's so much to talk about here. It's, it's almost a skimming surface, but, but again, just, just a sort of a framework to think about um, in terms of these different ways of, of going about interoperability. So APIs and FHIR, uh, the simple way that I think about it is APIs are sort of a common architecture. They are uh, a front door on an information system that allows you to knock on it and uh, figure out what to either pull out of it or put into it. Uh, or remove from it. Um, and the point is that we want those APIs to be standardized so that you don't have to go to every single EHR or lab information system or any other information system and build a custom interface uh, that allows you to pull or push data into it. Um, so, uh, so these are in the, the 21st century cures requirements to have uh, standards-based APIs. They're sort of essential to the current policy framework uh, for what EHRs need to do so that it can make it easier to work with data that's stored within them. Um, that is only helped if we also are speaking a common language. So the API just says, you know, this is what data we have and this is where it's located. Uh, but we also need to make sure that when you find that data, you can make sense of it. And when I say you, what I mean is not a human, an information system can make sense of it. Um, and so uh, FHIR is, is the set of data standards uh, that describe data formats and elements. Um, and, and again, uh, you know, what we're seeing is, is more and more work that helps think about the different FHIR use cases and how to uh, define and implement FHIR 
um, standards that allow key types of information to be encoded and worked with. So it's really the pairing of the architecture and the language that, that, is, that is sort of why everyone's so excited about that taking us the next step in interoperability because it's gonna make it much easier to access information uh, as well as work with it once it's been accessed because it is in this common language. Okay, so business, so bulk data export, uh, I, I don't even have a slide on it because it's just, uh, again, at, at, this, at this concept level, it's just the notion of when you're knocking on the door of an EHR system and you want to pull information, you don't want to have to do it patient by patient, especially if you're in a population uh, health world. You want to say, I either want all your patients with diabetes, or I want to be able to say, I want all the patients that are um, you know, on this particular value-based contract. So the ability to have a bulk data export is just essential uh, to be able to uh, support um, you know, value-based care and pop health in particular. Um, and so, uh, so that's part of the requirements for what uh, APIs need to be able to support. Okay, so business models aligned to incentivize interoperability. Again, this to me continues to be the Achilles heel of uh, interoperability is how do we create a payment system where uh, interoperability is clearly um, uh, strongly incentivized. And I think fee for service, I would argue that interoperability is perhaps disincentivized. And today we're sort of in this murky middle ground where some types of interoperability there's an incentive for, other types there's not. Um, and so I think we're still really trying to figure out how do we get those strong financial incentives um, and, and, and business models aligned behind them to uh, promote interoperability. Next slide. So there's been a little bit of, uh, of sort of thinking around this, I'll say, and, and in your neck of the woods um, in, in sort of the Pacific Northwest, I think, you know, Intel and Providence have been, you know, some of the more uh, innovative organizations in terms of thinking about how do you use contracting and procurement language to, to essentially require interoperability. Um, it's, it's hard to do, uh, but they have sort of written a little bit about that experience and what they've learned from it. Um, there was also a National Academy of Medicine report on procuring interoperability, taking lessons from other industries on how, for example, um, uh, uh, the U.S. Um, you know, military often uh, require, you know, sort of writes interoperability requirements into their uh, procurement contracts. Um, and so again, these are using sort of market-based tools to essentially use market power to drive interoperability. Um, it, it is a very powerful tool, um, but I think we haven't quite figured out how to use it in, in the healthcare context. Um, but I do raise it because it is something that's been very powerful in other industries. And I think if we can still um, uh, try to figure out whether this model can work in the healthcare context, it, it can be very powerful. And payers in particular, I think, are in a strong uh, position to think about using contracting as well as large provider organizations. Um, to really think about how do we use, you know, uh, the power of, uh, of contracts and, and, um, and purchasing uh, to, to drive progress here. Next slide. Okay, so new policy efforts. Again, there's so much going on here with 21st century cures. I mean, even frankly, with the High Tech Act and meaningful use, and even though it's sort of evolved over time, that was really one of the largest drivers of interoperability were, were the meaningful use criteria that required summary of care records to be exchanged when, when patients transition uh, between health, uh, between, you know, healthcare provider uh, uh, settings and organizations. Um, so that was really the, the first policy effort um, uh, at scale that drove interoperability. Um, but, but through 21st century cures and, and even some of the new, um, you know, more, more recent policies, there's just been an ongoing effort to try to um, make progress on, on the different um, domains of, uh, of, 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 of need for interoperability. So again, I'm just going to touch on, on one of them um, uh, because I've already talked a bit about um, 21st century cures, which was really when fire-based APIs were introduced. Um, and, and the more current, though still not yet finalized, um, policy uh, relates uh, to, um, to sort of a, an interoperability framework that would just help um, uh, what, what today is, is a fairly fragmented approach to interoperability with lots of different types of networks that exist um, and a recognition that many organizations need to connect to multiple networks. Um, in order to have access to the data that they need, but yet even in that case, it may not be everything they need. Um, and, and so this, this sort of bottom-up approach to allowing networks to spring up, um, you know, wherever it could be sustainable has sort of resulted in uh, our current state of, you know, too many networks and, and real, really provider frustration with, I just want to be able to connect to one network and be able to get all the information I need through that network. 
So that was really the genesis of why we needed this uh, trusted exchange framework and common agreement, um, because it's what, what allows networks to talk to each other and ideally allow provider organizations to have a single on-ramp uh, that allows them to, to get to that kind of connectivity. Uh, so next slide. Um, so, so again, what are the goals of TEFCA? They want to uh, uh, acknowledge that there are many networks that exist today that are working well. The goal is not to replace anything that currently exists, um, but really just to figure out how to better stitch them together. Um, and that's uh, both from a sort of technical perspective as well as from a, a governance perspective. So the, the CA and TEFCA is common agreement. Um, and that's really about the governance piece of exchange to make sure that, that um, when two networks connect, they are adhering to a common governance framework to ensure that there is the appropriate access uh, to data within those networks. Um, and so, um, so again, you know, provide a single on-ramp to interoperability for all, that's really the key. Any provider organization can just connect to one type of network and, and get access to the data that lives in all the different networks that, that have uh, joined TEFCA. Um, as well as you know, be scalable uh, and allow um, us to move from a state where uh, we're competing to get access to the data to a state where we're competing based on the value that can be created by using the data. Um, so again, I think that's a really important vision for TEFCA is that right now there's just too much work just to get to the starting line. Uh, and, and really what we want competition to do is, is to improve how data is, is managed and worked with. Next slide. Um, okay, I think we talked, talked about that already. Um, I think we'll, we'll skip the details, but but you know this all does come together in a you know in a vision where we have you know fire-based APIs that allow data to you know move in and out of specific EHRs to uh, meet certain use cases. So, for example, here's an example of a care plan app that could work with an API um, to pull data in or to move data out to support uh, care management. Uh, and then sort of on the other end of things is, uh, is, is TEFCA with the interconnected networks uh, that allow sort of uh, the data to move, uh, you know, where, where it's needed um, to support care. So this all sort of does, I think, come together in, in one ecosystem that allows both sort of the app-based notion of let's solve a particular use case with a particular app uh, that could be embedded in a particular EHR, all the way to on the other end, uh, uh, you know, national connectivity where, uh, you know, patient data can move to where it's needed um, to, to support the care of that, that specific patient or a population. Okay, next slide. Okay, I think we're heading into the end here. So, so again, as I sort of pull back out from everything that's happening uh, in, in all these different categories, I really think about like, what is the sweet spot here? What are we trying to move towards? And I think it's really balancing the incentives where there is a strong financial incentive to exchange data in a way that allows it to follow the patients or populations based on where they're getting their care. Um, but we also recognize that there are a lot of barriers to doing that now. Um, and, and a lot of those barriers relate to technology and standards as well as governance. Um, and so we need both. We need the strong incentives and we need to make it easier to share information. And I think it's only when we get those two things in balance that will really make a lot of progress. So when I look today at all the different things I've talked about, I see that there's a huge amount of activity on the lowering barrier side, right? We have the API piece, we have TEFCA, we have you know, uh, you know, efforts on just improving patient matching. We didn't even talk about that, but a really important piece. Um, so there's a lot that's being done to try to lower barriers to interoperability. But when I look at what is there that's really driving the financial incentives, what is gonna get a CFO of an organization to say, we need to invest more in interoperability. That's the only way that our healthcare organization is gonna be financially sustainable is if we invest more in interoperability. Like that's the conversation that I wanna see happening. And I just worry that we just don't have the strength of financial incentives today. Um, and, and that's really where if we're gonna bring this into balance where we need to be sure that we're focusing. So again, we see shifts to bundled payment, accountable care, value-based models. But as Karen said, it's like we're just not far enough on the right end of the spectrum there yet for it to really be driving, um, you know, sort of primary core business models. It's sort of more of a, almost a workaround. Like, well, how do we do a better job for this, you know, small group of our population that's under, you know, value-based care? Again, I think we're seeing that move, but it still feels like it's moving too slowly for me. Uh, to feel confident that we're going to really make a lot of progress in, in, in tackling the interoperability barriers. Um, and even as I see, you know, the way that interoperability is incorporated into MIPS and, you know, new payment models, again, it's just sort of lost in a sea of, of too many other things that, that's happening. So I guess what I really encourage as these conversations to happen is that you really think about 
both sides of, of, of achieving the sweet spot, um, but, but just would encourage you to pay particular attention to the financial incentives piece and making sure that there is a really strong business case to exchange information. Uh, because at the end of the day, even if we can get rid of all of the barriers, there just still needs to be that incentive uh, to, to share data and to use it to make better decisions. Um, and, and I think it just feels like that, that uh, end point is, is still um, you know, not right around the corner. So I hope these comments have been helpful as background to your conversation. And Karen, uh, we'll turn it back over to you in terms of question or discussion from here. Yeah, someone was gonna have to tell me I was on mute. <laughs> nobody could talk. Yeah, so we're going to ask what you think again after hearing her talk. Um, and thank you, Julia, so helpful, so clear. And it really does help us to see sort of, I think, where the challenges and um, enablers are and how we use those. I think that's really helpful. So as they are responding to the poll here, I'm going to take the slides down and we're getting some really great questions and comments coming in. And I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna sort of get things started there with a, a couple of questions to you, Julia. And I think um, as a starting point, so one of the questions that we got, a couple of them are related here. I think that survey you shared is really intriguing that you did. And uh, Sarah Green in our audience, um, one of our board members at the Alliance here asks about a JAMA. There was a JAMA study that you published um, talking about the um, um, competition elements that you were talking about. She's asking if it's a, if it's a social, cultural, and interorganizational aspects, um, where does the issue of market competition fit into that socio-cultural and interorganizational aspect? Um, and is acting as a persistent impediment for progress. We also got another, you know, couple questions about are there good models out there for understanding how when blocking data is occurring and what that looks like. Um, so can you speak to sort of the behavior of, and, and that sounds, it's really more focused on the provider behavior within it. We have another sort of related question on the EHR technology side of this. Yes. Okay. So that's a lot to unpack, but let me uh, do my best to, to try. So, 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 I mean, yes, I think it is a cultural shift um, to be able to both, you know, to think about uh, other providers in your market as both competitors and collaborators. Um, and, and that frankly is what we need to do. Um, and, and I think it is um, hard because we're not building on a tradition of, uh, a, you know, a, or a, a cultural norm uh, of, of collaborating while competing. Um, but I think to make progress in interoperability, we have to figure out how to hold those two notions together. Um, and again, I think we're starting to see that happening. I think there are discussions and collaborations existing today that didn't exist, you know, uh, three or four years ago. So I think we're starting to move in that direction. But but I, I think the, the, just the whole way that we talk about um, uh, uh, competition uh, while recognizing their needs that, that in order to be most competitive, we also need to collaborate with our competitors is, is what we need to get to. And it's, um, it's not easy, but I do think that is perhaps the question is referring to sort of that, you know, socio-cultural uh, reframing uh, that, that does need to occur. Uh, and again, it's like, what are we competing on the basis of? We should not be competing on the basis of having access to data. We should be competing on the basis of what we can do with the data to better serve patients and populations. So that is, I think, the key reframing that needs to happen. Um, and again, I'm not saying yeah. it's easy, but I think if we can keep, keep that mantra in mind. So information blocking, I, in some ways I didn't touch on it because it's such an, a, a complex piece of this. So I think the way that I think about it is, um, is that, uh, so, so the regulations have gone into effect. Uh, there are now um, you know, uh, a series of, uh, of, of specific exceptions where information cannot be shared um, uh, sort of appropriate reasons to not share information. And outside of those, information does need to be, um, you know, shared to support uh, patient care. Um, I think uh, the teeth that information blocking has uh, are, are weak because at the end of the day, to be able to really prove that information blocking is happening, to have it essentially go through, uh, you know, an evidentiary court, you know, trial type process to prove it. Um, you know, I'm just worried about the ability to really um, uh, uh, use that policy framework to, to rapidly and agilely uh, uh, sort of uh, open up data where it exists. So I think I'm glad we have the regulations. I think they're helpful. I think people can point to them. Um, but, but again, it almost feels like that's going to be on one very far end of the spectrum dealing with really egregious behavior um, as, as opposed to just sort of the 
the sociocultural, you know, uh, uh, issue of just sort of let's just get more comfortable uh, with, you know, with with talking to competitors about sharing data. Um, you know, I don't think information the information blocking framework is really going to get us to that sociocultural shift. Um, and again, I think that's where most of the action can and should happen. Um, so again, they're good regulations. I support them, but I just don't think that those are going to be the main driver of change in the coming years um, because it's again going to be so hard to to sort of enforce them. Um, so I, I almost feel like they've already had their effect. Like we know what information blocking is. We're actually using the terms. We're sort of uh, you know we can say like we think what you're doing is information blocking, and almost just the you know th that that sense of like that is not something we should be doing today. Uh, is perhaps the most powerful part, as opposed to actually having to wait to, to get to a final verdict on someone whether someone really was or wasn't information blocking. Yeah. So, um, and, and it, as you're speaking, the poll was closed, and the top two um, selections were um, almost a dead heat here. Um, policy number one followed very closely by value-based payment models. So it really is both, you know, the policy that's creating sort of, I love the on-ramp, but the really key is we got to get on the road and use the on, use the on-ramp. And, and it's really, you know, you can build it, but what do you put through it? We have time for maybe one more quick question here. And it has to do with the, um, um, and I'm, I'm not seeing it in front of me right now, I apologize, but it had to do with sort of what is, is there a policy position on EHR um, behavior around making their systems interoperable in a way that is accessible for all to accomplish? Sure. Um, so again, you know, uh, EHR vendors cannot engage in information blocking. That is now, you know, yeah. uh, on the books and, and happening. So again, on that far extreme end, you know, if EHR vendors are engaging in information blocking, there should now be a process uh, by which to, to sort of address that. Um, uh, I think the other key thing that EHR vendors are on the hook for is, um, is, is making sure that they have certified systems that have Firebase APIs. Um, and we didn't talk about uh, US CDI, US core data for interoperability, um, but part of the regulation is that there is a set of data um, that will be expanded over time and EHR vendors will be required if they want to have a certified system uh, to make that information available via a Firebase API. Um, and so, so that, is, that is basically what EHR vendors are required to do today. Um, and, uh, and it's, you know, I think it's a, it's a pretty, um, uh, uh, specific and detailed framework, uh, that, that, that makes it clear what they need to do. Um, but is it, uh, that they need to make it available every single piece of data that's in their EHR to anyone who may want it? No, it's not that. Um, and, and so, uh, so again, you know, I think that's where, um, it's really important to understand what is required at any point in time. Um, but also, you know, to be able to advocate for how that should be expanded over time. So, you know, are there key types of data that are not um, part of US CDI that, that, that are really critical for value-based care? Um, I think we're going to need to, as a community, come to an understanding of, of which types of data uh, need to be made available uh, via those, those EHR APIs, um, because uh, that it's only once it's part of US CDI is, is that type of data going to be sort of robustly available through, through EHRs. And needless to say, like EHRs are only a piece of this whole puzzle, right? There's laboratory information systems, information systems that are in nursing homes, uh, you know, public health information systems. So, so again, like in some ways, the regulations, while they're transformative and, and, and vast in scope, they also only touch a relatively small part of the ecosystem uh, when we look at sort of every piece of data that might be relevant. Um, you know, those regulations will only apply to EHRs, which is, you know, which only house a, a subset of, of the information that we need for true value-based care and in population health management. Yeah, thank you so much. I wish we could talk longer. I, we're going to um, need to, I'm, I'm going to ask you not to go far. I think you're going to stay with this and to the extent that you can, and there may be more questions. We're going to um, there's a few questions we're not able to get to right now that have come up around the concept of data sover sovereignty. How do we talk about that as we expand oper interoperability, HIPAA considerations, um, and it says, how does HIPAA law impact interoperability and does it need revision to help with this goal? 
um, as and I think Dr. Berwick has proposed. And then another question really about sort of the privacy concerns and inter interoperability around behavioral health and substance use. We will, for those of you who are asking these questions, we will take these um, and take note of them. If we don't get them addressed, we will um, make sure that they are addressed in some way um, following the webinar. So thank you, Julia. And I'm gonna invite um, Vishal and Kathy to join us, tell you a little bit about them as they are coming up. And I do think we have, Amy, am I missing something? If I am, you just jump in and tell me here. Um, so Kathy is the strategic IT advisor for the Healthcare Authority. She partners across HCA to help define and shape the technology vision and influence in the agency's strategic objectives. She holds a degree in human services and business administration from Washington State University and is a member of HCA's executive leadership team. Also delighted to have Vishal Chaudhry with us, who is the chief data officer. He is an experienced and successful change agent and leader with more than 20 years implementing and improving business processes across the healthcare, electronic and um, automotive industries, an interesting journey, right? Um, so while he works for HCA, HCA, HCA is uniquely positioned in the state of Washington to impact the health and wellness of millions of residents. Excited to work alongside dedicated colleagues and contribute to solving some of the most systemic, vexing systemic problems faced in healthcare today using data and analytics. Well, that's why you're here. This is good. Thank you both very much. I'm going to start with asking you each to just sort of um, talk a little bit about how the state and particularly the authority views its role in sort of this interoperability sea change that we're talking about here, and then specifically describe what your role is and your focus is from the seat that you are sitting in at the authority. So Kathy, I'll start with you on that. Sure. <clears throat> so. Um... I think that that's an interesting question. We have actually done some strategic planning around interoperability to answer that question. What is the state's role? Do we see ourselves as uh, conveners, um, as uh, visioners that help uh, in setting forth a path for the state? Um, are we merely in a seat to talk about compliance? Uh, so it's an interesting question. Um, I don't think that we are, as a state, are in a place to do a lot of the building. There are some infrastructure framework pieces that we could uh, build and share, but I don't see our role necessarily as a builder of some of the infrastructure. Um, but I do think that uh, the state plays a role in helping to align many of the pieces that we've just talked about. So when we talk about some of the uh, barriers, some of the policy pieces, uh, really important for me that we think about interoperability and particularly when we think about its success uh, related to value-based payments, um, that we think about interoperability not just as a technical problem. And I think we've talked a bit about that already uh, and look at the behavioral workflow changes that are needed uh, for this, some of the governance pieces some of the organizational changes as uh, folks uh, may struggle to figure out what the data means. And some of those are roles that the state could assist with, particularly in the value-based uh, payment uh, work that we're doing. So those are a couple of areas that I think um, our role as a state could influence this. Um, and, um, and in the technology world as well, certainly a lot of technology challenges um, that we can um, assist with uh, some of those connections. Um, one of the other things, um, and, and touch a little bit on, on it um, in the, the previous conversation is about figuring out what the data means. And we've been involved in some of those national conversations about this, what the standards look like, but I think those will evolve as uh, we start to use the data and figure out that those data uh, may not mean exactly what they need to mean in a clinical setting or in a value-based purchasing setting. So those are some other areas that I think the state uh, could play a role. Thank you. <laughs> Michelle? Well, um, well. I think everything that um, can be covered has been covered. Uh, the only couple of things that I might add to the conversation is um, I really liked that one slide that Julia presented where, you know, the what, the how, and the who. Um, 
and it's been my experience working in in the space of you know process optimization of data, all that. Be careful what you ask for; you might just get it. For example, if we want the entire record, let's say we get to a place where the entire record is available for every clinician to see at the point of care. It's too much. I think we need to get to the point where we're helping users ask better questions and then find ways to provide meaningful answers to those questions to help with what they're trying to accomplish at that moment of time. We're a long way from there, from, but from a, and that, that goes to both, uh, you know, achieving interoperability as a means to accomplish that work, but also the impact of accomplishing that on truly delivering value to the patients. Um, so that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is, um, and I think it was touched briefly on, is governance and privacy. We talk about that, we talk about that mostly coming at it from a fear perspective, right? But thinking about the value of the data, um, you know, when you think about the, the European context here in GDPR, um, there is a lot of emphasis on data privacy, but not as much proportionally on health data privacy as it is on general identity security in Europe. And there's a reason for that. There's a difference in how valuable health data are within the context of the United States versus other countries. And it's a reflection of how we pay for care. At the end of the day, it's all about money, right? So how we govern data, how we um, implement the rules and regulations, how we develop the policies and then implement them either on the visioning, from a visioning perspective, from a compliance perspective, from an infrastructure perspective, I think we need to take all those perspectives into account as we build those. Sorry, I went on mute there, so I wasn't giving you an echo. So thank you very much for that. I think that, you know, I think the visioning is so important and it's, you know, we're hearing a lot of alignment, I think, even in just the questions. I think the real challenge is how do we move that to action? You know, what do we all do differently? I, I was sort of struck by Julia's slide that had the access that she said she borrowed from another colleague that talked about sort of, you know, who's solving the problems where. And locally, as we were, again, poking around and looking at this, um, talking to different folks, it appears that a lot of those sort of the kinds of value exchanges we're talking about to support value-based success seem to be happening a lot sort of in the clinically integrated networks, one of the places Julia highlighted where they happen. And what was really striking to me is that within one of these large clinically integrated networks on the western half of the state, um, they were dealing with a hundred different IT vendors. So EHRs and then the labs and the long-term care. And I want to acknowledge that Dr. Fisher, who put a comment in the or asked a question or made a comment question, I think, but shared some thoughts with this beforehand too, high cost and poor safety continuity for inpatient and SNF transfers will make value a steep hill to climb as long as interoperability is mediocre. These transfers remain a flashpoint. And so, you know, what do we do about something like that? Do we leave it to the ACOs to solve or do we try to do it in a more sort of, um, you know, a way that Julia could use Washington State as a bright spot, since she just says there are no bright spots or examples. Could we become that and how do we do that? Who has to act differently? I think actually that's one of, um, when, when I think about some of the bright spots in interoperability, uh, not, not focusing on the barriers, and there are many of them, uh, but the emphasis, um, and particularly we see this on the value-based care side, that this is not just about healthcare, and this is public health. This is the social service providers and the connections of those, which are very different when you think about the interoperability and what they need to do that. Um, and I think that's um, an area of focus. We've talked a lot about it at the Healthcare Authority, talking about um, what kind of EHR-like um, implementations are needed in some of those settings, because uh, I think that's one of the keys to making some of this work. It's not just EHRs in hospital settings, 
or lab settings or the traditional pieces. Uh, but I think that's one of the bright spots, not necessarily that we've moved toward um, implementation of that yet, but there's just a lot of conversation that recognizes that we need to go beyond uh, traditional healthcare settings to make some of that work. So, and the audience is asking, do you think the ACA could have a role in continuing the work toward interoperability? If not, do you see other regional partners who could be neut neutral? Um, I thought it said natural, but neutral backbone to support these historically siloed systems. Kathy, you want to take that? Do you want me to? Go ahead and, and start out, Vishal, and I'll add. Go ahead. Um, so the short answer is yes. <laughs> the long answer is there is a role for all of us. Um, the state, the, the traditional clinical care providers, both large systems and you know individual providers, smaller entities, community-based organizations, conveners like the ACHs, um, payers like the MCOs and other commercial plans. Um, and I would say community-based organizations again, um, and maybe again, because the sheer number of those organizations and the diversity of community-based organizations that provide um, care to our population. If you, if you take the word care just on its face value and remove the clinical part of it, and assume that clinical care is part of the total care that's delivered, then suddenly we expand that horizon and expand and broaden our partner base in the state in achieving um, really meaningful value care delivery to our patients and our populations. Now, how do we achieve that? What role everyone has to play? Um, I'm gonna go back to the conversation we had with Julia around the incentives. Yes, there are policy levers. Yes, there are financial levers. Yes, there are behavioral, um, there's behavioral evolution that needs to happen on all sides as, as people and entities start seeing their own role differently. Um, it's all of that combined. Um, so different kinds of incentives, some intrinsic, some extrinsic. Um, I'll stop there. Yeah, and I don't have much to add to that other than to say that I do think um, like ACHs are uh, critical conveners in um, the space that we're working in, in terms of the, the entire healthcare community. And I think it's going to take the entire community to get anywhere, to get closer to interoperability and to provide that balance um, that Julia talked about between um, you know, the incentives and lowering barriers. I think the lowering of the barriers themselves, um, interoperability is not going to happen as long as it's really, really hard to do and we need to make it easier. Um, and, and I think there's a, a role for all of the partners uh, within the healthcare community to help us do that. So as, as an organization that's a large purchaser of healthcare on behalf of many in the state, and as an organization that works closely with purchasers, including the authority as one of our members, you know, to help them purchase, is it reasonable for those that are paying for healthcare to sort of take more the procurement strategy, I think a little bit that Joy was talking about to say, hey, we want to contract with your network, but a requirement of your network is that all providers within your network are sharing information on behalf of our population. Does that seem to be a regional reasonable approach? And if it does, why, why aren't we doing that already? So I think that's a really important piece of the approach, not only um, from a provider perspective, but some of the um, network, um, the networks of providers that we're looking at, community exchange networks, those kinds of things to make sure that we are building into our contracts, um, that there is some interoperability. Um, I also agree that that's really hard to do. Um, but we are actually looking, having a lot of conversations about that and um, doing some research on how we can build that into procurements. Um, not just to say we need to be compliant with the rules that are out there, but I think the rules are just a starting point. And um, we're trying to 
um, be a little bit more creative in how we look at some of those connections and build those into our procurement. So I think it's a big piece. I know you're still out there. I'm going to I'm going to ping you as just sort of the last point here, and um, to say, are, are you are you familiar with any sort of large purchasers looking at this from from a patient really being acting as the patient advocate in this? Are you aware of any activity in that space? Julia's on mute. She may have walked away. Well, we'll we'll continue to have uh, that. Sorry, I'm I'm still here. Um, yeah. Uh, so, um, sorry, and when you say active in that space, you mean like on the procurement side or? Well, I'm thinking about a purchaser who purchases through a health plan and says, here's a requirement, here are all the requirements for the health plan and that network. Yeah. What if purchasers started saying, um, a requirement of the network is that the providers within the network share information on behalf of those that they care for. So with that, again, I, you know, I wasn't in the midst of it, but like that, in theory, that was what the Intel you know, model was trying to do. Um, and, and I know that, it, it, you know, it, it didn't go as well, maybe. I mean, again, I don't want to speak, you know, full for it, but I think that, that would be a model to look towards that, that I think tried to do that. Uh, the NHS in, in England has also tried sort of to go the way of, of using um, a procurement language and the contracts with its vendors. Again, it's a very different vendor marketplace. They're pretty much just four main ambulatory vendors. Um, so I do think there are places to look to, um, uh, to, to sort of learn from their experiences. But again, there, there's, there's no one that I've seen that has, has been able to, in part because it's writing the language itself is so complex. Um, but you also talked about the bipartisan policy um, group. And, and one of the things that came out of that work was um, an effort among the healthcare leadership council organizations to come to agreement on some language that could be integrated into their contracts. So again, I think there's some places to look, uh, but there's not the model to take that, that you would just say, well, we should just replicate what, what this group has done. Well, I, I would love to spend more time in this conversation, but we're going to um, um, move on to our boots on the ground folks and thank um, Kathy and Vishal and, and thank Julia again, although I think if you can stay around there, we may have some time at the very end to hit some last questions here. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Amy and to Alia and the boots on the ground crew. Hi everyone. So Jenny is going to promote Jeremiah, Randy, and Elia while I set us up for this next section. One more word cloud for everyone to participate in. So we really appreciate your participation. Who do you see as the champions for change in all of this work? Um, and then I will kind of get us set while Elia and everyone get set up. Thank you all so much, Karen, Vishal, Kathy, such a valuable information and important discussion. So um, as Karen mentioned, we're moving into kind of our boots on the ground perspective. Um, as today's panelists are getting set up, participate in our word cloud. Um, I really think of today's panel as a great representation of those champions for change working toward that patient-centric piece that Karen talked about at the beginning of, of the hour or the hour and a half that we're at now. We have today with us Elia Prostowski, Executive Director of, of the Rural Collaborative. She'll be moderating our conversation as well as kind of lending her rural perspective lens to the conversation. And then Jer Jeremiah Bernhardt, physician with Iora Health, previously with Swedish, and Randy Coughlin, Director of Population Health with M Bright, who will be sharing their learnings and expertise within this work. So I will now turn it over to Elia. I'll leave the word cloud up for another minute or so before locking it and stopping sharing my screen so we can focus on our speakers. Thank you. Hello and good morning. This is Elia Prostowski. Thanks for the introduction, Amy, and thank you so much for the invitation to moderate this panel. I'm very excited that we have two folks here that are really closely uh, closely working in the area, both of patient care, population health, value-based care, and um, to quote uh, Karen quoting me, making sure that people talk to each other. So um, I'm gonna start just, I, what I'd like to do first is have both Jeremiah and Randy talk a little bit about their journeys, about how they got to where they are and why they're doing what they're doing. I think both of them have actually interesting trajectories of where they were right before they landed in their current landing spots. And I'm also hoping that you both could talk a little bit about Iora and Embright because folks may not be familiar with what you guys do. So I'm gonna start with you, Jeremiah, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off. All right, um, I'm Jeremiah Bernhardt, uh, family physician um, at Iora Primary Care. Um, 
So I was previously at uh, the Swedish Family Medicine Residency at Cherry Hill as faculty for the last six years and recently moved over to Iora Primary Care a couple of weeks ago. Um, I've been increasingly interested in uh, policy and specifically in uh, primary care investment and working to create a primary care system that works better for our patients in achieving their uh, health goals and outcomes. Um, and through that work, I've um, really been drawn to uh, the fact that it's, it's about the underlying sort of framework and policy and finances that allow um, us to, uh, or really sort of reduce barriers to doing the right things for patients. Um, and uh, ultimately uh, moving towards a primary care uh, clinical system that is um, entirely value-based um, at full risk um, was what felt to be the best uh, career move for me. Um, and so I recently moved to Iora Primary Care, which is a primary care um, clinical system uh, working with uh, Medicare um, patients uh, and uh, doing value-based care um, in a full risk model. Thanks, Jeremiah. And can I ask you uh, just a follow-up question? You are a provider. Um, you, you actually see patients, boots on the ground. Can you just share with us what is the most extraordinary measure you've taken to get information about one of your patients to the right spot to provide the best and highest quality level of care that you could have? The most extraordinary measure taken? Yeah, like phone calls, faxes, in your pajamas in the middle of the night, trying to get a cell phone service connection. I'm sure you have a story. I think I think I want to take this down to the, the ground level. Take it down to the ground. Um, I think that uh, you know one of our one of the challenges I've had in my entire career is um, being able to get uh, quality. Um, information for my patients um, who have recently been hospitalized, um, getting good um, discharge summary information. Uh, and I think one of the things that's challenging is when patients, uh, patients don't always go to the same hospital as everybody knows. Um, and certainly if, if you are working in a clin clinically integrated system, uh, patients might go to that hospital or they might find themselves in another hospital. And so um, being able to get uh, accurate information, um, an accurate uh, medication list, um, an accurate list of conditions that were covered during that hospitalization, and most importantly, um, a synopsis of the cognitive work that the providers have done uh, to care for those patients. Um, and I think that's, that's probably the biggest um, challenge that I've continue to face. It's, um, it's one thing to be able to get uh, a list of conditions and a list of medications, but it's another thing to get the thought processing and the individual specifics related to that patient around sort of how people thought about their problem, how they analyzed all the information they had, uh, so that then I can take that information as a primary care doc and move the care plan forward um, in my office. That's awesome. I just, I've seen so many providers go to the mat for their patients to get information where it needs to go. So thank you for sharing. Uh, Randy, can you tell us a little bit about Embright and what that is? And also you have a unique experience coming from Athena. Um, and I didn't see Athena as a logo on one of the earlier slides. So I think it'd be worthwhile to talk a little bit about that too, because you definitely have a unique journey. Yeah. So um, I'm at Embright, which is a CIN formed through the partnership of UW Medicine uh, Multicare and LifePoint. I've been there for about a year and a half, which is basically when uh, the partnership was first announced. And so, you know, we're really in the formation stages. And as you'd expect from a CIN, uh, interoperability is a key piece of that puzzle. So definitely a topic that I'm uh, interested in and excited to discuss today. Um, and as you mentioned, yeah, before I was working at Athena Health for the past three years prior to that. And uh, in that role, I was working on their pop health product, not the EHR side, but closely with that. And I was working a lot with um, ACOs, mainly in the Medicare Shared Savings Program. And you know, for a lot of ACOs, that was their first foray into value-based care. And it was definitely a, a learning curve for a lot of organizations in terms of how to 
aggregate that data, how to make use of it, how to um, just really understand it. And that cultural shift uh, that Julie was talking about, I kind of lived through that with them. And so, you know, I, I really resonate with, with that um, with that message. And I think uh, now that I'm with, at Embright, you know, we're kind of working on building up our capabilities here. And so I think, uh, yeah, there's been a lot of change in the industry and uh, advances, but I think there's a long way to go as well. Awesome, thanks. Um, so I have a question again uh, for both of you. Uh, one of you is in kind of the IPA, the primary care setting with the specialist. Another one is in the clinically integrated network. Um, you both are responsible for, uh, for patients in either directly or indirectly. You don't have to touch a patient to be part of their care. Um, if you could wave a magic wand right now and um, get information or ch change, change something, what would you change? Jeremiah, would you go first? Yeah, um, I would change the payment model. Um, I would move out of fee-for-service and move into uh, value-based care um, entirely. And uh, I think that it, you know, when, when I think about interoperability, I'm also thinking about how the care team, how my care team is able to organize our work, um, how we're able to have a place in the day to do the work, to manage our patients, to manage their chronic conditions, to think about their preventative health, and to think about the population of the patients that I serve. Um, the fee-for-service model uh, incentivizes, obviously, bringing patients into the clinic, being able to generate a billable service. Um, and there are some uh, financial incentives that have been created that add some uh, income to uh, clinical systems in order to do population health. Um, but in my experience, it hasn't been to the degree where it actually makes us say, how do we carve out an hour of our day to do this, ma this care management? Um, so at Iora, we spend an entire hour every single morning going over our patients. So this morning, um, I spent, we spent a half an hour going through every patient that we have um, in our clinic who's hospitalized right now, reviewing their records, reviewing how the hospitalization is going, thinking about what we're going to do as primary care providers when they exit the hospital. We also go through a list of all the patients that have recently been discharged, what we have done to help those patients uh, stay out of the hospital and what we're going to continue to do going forward going through a list of our patients that we're just worried about in general that we think are at risk of um, seeking or needing ER visits or hospitalizations. Um, and then we spend another half hour going through the patients that are coming in today and really thinking about what are the chronic conditions that we can address? How can we address the, their acute issues today, but also continue to address their chronic conditions? Um, and it's really, you know, a system that moves away from fee-for-service creates an ability to carve out an entire hour of time. In a fee-for-service model, carving out an entire hour of time might mean losing three or four E&M visits for that day, which is something that's difficult to financially justify. Thanks, Jeremiah. Follow-up question before I give the magic wand question to Randy. Uh, we talked earlier, we heard earlier about payers. Um, you have uh, a lot of Medi Medicare Advantage at Iora, so I understand it. But the, my question is, um, and I know the answer to this, so it's a softball. Do you do separate care team huddles for different payers based on different contracts, or do you treat all of your patients as your patient population, irrespective of who their payer is? Yeah, so we treat everybody the same. So um, it's, uh, you know, we're focused on providing uh, excellent primary care to all of our patients, uh, regardless of who their payer is. Um, and I think that's another really important question because um, if you're doing sort of hybrid models of uh, value-based care, you do have to have enough financial incentive to be able to financially justify doing all this work for every one of your patients. Um, yeah. 
Thank you. Um, all right, Randy, magic wand question. You got the benefit. I didn't give mm. these questions to them ahead of time. So you got the benefit of having a chance to think about it. Yeah, I would definitely agree with what Jeremiah said. And, you know, add on to that, I think it's uh, definitely true that it requires a big shift and there has to be the right incentive structure. And so I think from the provider side, there has to be the right um, incentive structure from the value-based care agreement side of things. Like there needs to be kind of the right priorities and there has to be harmonization across because like, you can't do you can't do everything at the same time. You got to be able to prioritize and really dedicate uh, to solving those problems. So I think like being able to treat all your patients the same way, regardless of contract, you know, I think to have the contracts kind of define value-based success similarly kind of helps you to prioritize that way. So that's kind of an important thing from my perspective. Yeah, and that must be helpful that you have a kind of a large footprint. I, um, for those of you who don't know what the Rural Collaborative is and who we are, we are 21 rural public hospital district hospitals in the state of Washington. And when we have a value-based contract at one of our health systems, it may only have a hundred lives in it for that one contract. And it becomes very problematic and difficult to try to do management um, for that, that one subset of individuals. So they do, as Jeremiah said, they, they treat everybody the same. Um, so my question now is for either of you, since neither one of you seems um, to be centered in one of these larger systems that tend to uh, really drive market forces and interoperability and EHR platforms like the, a Providence or a Dignity uh, Health, the CHI Franciscan. Um, what do you see as their obligation in pushing or being drivers of movement towards interoperability for shared patient populations? And do you, do you see, or do they not have an obligation? I can start. I mean, I think um, we need to be, you know, investing in the right technology that can integrate with, you know, multiple EMRs. It has to be like EMR agnostic to be able to, to, to share that information. And I think, you know, it's, a, there's a lot of different factors that go into that and, you know, having the right partners, being collaborative um, and, you know, entering into the right payment models to support that. So, so I think there definitely is a role to play, but um, I think, you know, there's the, the policy side of things like having the right standards, API, API and uh, fire. I think those are key factors as well. So it's definitely a lot of things that play into it that um, I think we all can help to, to influence and drive. Yeah, I, I see all of us in healthcare, uh, regardless of whether we're in big or small systems, um, in private practice or large group practices is having the same obligation, uh, which is to our patients. So we have an obligation to patient safety. We have an obligation to help our patients to be well. We have an obligation to listen to, understand and validate and value our patients. Um, and I, I don't think that any of those of us in the healthcare industry are wanting to do anything outside of that as our sort of core value. Um, but I think that the incentives and the financial incentives make that more challenging or less challenging. And I think that, um, so I, I really believe that policies that reduce the barriers to doing that um, obligation uh, and that work for our patients are incredibly important and creating incentives that make it simple for everyone to do the best for our patients is, is, is really the way forward. Thank you. Um, so I see, I'm just gonna do a quick time check. It's 1126. I don't know if there's been any questions that have come in to the chat that um, either Amy, I don't know if you see any, you have not been monitoring it. There's been some sort of comments. I, there's one question that um, came in before you all started, but I think could be relevant here. Do you have any specific recommendations or resources related to interoperability for behavioral health SUD providers? Um, given the more stringent privacy recommendations for these fields, it can be especially challenging to get buy-in for interoperability. And I wonder if either of you as providers in the primary care space have any thoughts about that. I mean, 
the thought I have, I don't have a technical solution to it, um, but I would say it's incredibly important. Um, I mean, mental health is obviously such a huge component of all of our uh, overall health. Um, I think that uh, it's, you know, the mental health providers that help me, you know, to help all of us care for our patients, um, the, the information that they get for patients, their, their assessments of patients is incredibly important. And being able to have access to that is, is really important to being able to provide uh, high quality care for patients. Um, you know, I think it was Vishal that said earlier that, um, you know, we need to think of ways to integrate outside of what we commonly think of as healthcare. So integrating uh, social care, uh, integrating all of the aspects that relate to social determinants of health, uh, mental health is really important. I mean, most of our patients' health is related to behavioral issues, social determinants of health. Um, there's not so much clinically that we can do that can impact patients' health. And so finding ways to integrate all of this information is incredibly important. Thank you. And I see we see Ginny now. So um, I think we should probably transition. I'll just uh, close by thanking Jeremiah and Randy and for putting up with my questions that I did not prepare you for. You guys did a great job. I really appreciate what you're doing to support uh, population health and to support patients that you serve. And I will close with my favorite quote that's from one of my dear friends, Dr. Robin Fenn, who some of you may know. She says, data moves at the speed of trust. And I don't think we've talked about that uh, at all today, but I think trust is very important and important for us to be considering as we move forward in these bold ventures. And with that, I will, I think I'm turning it over to Ginny and one other person, but I'll turn it over to you, Ginny, to take. Thank you, Ellie, and thank you for the quote and for trusting us with your time this afternoon, this morning. So we are going to challenge you as our last um, ask for the group to tell us one thing you are motivated to do differently based on what you heard today. So again, this is with Poll Everywhere, so you can go to pollev.com backslash FHCQ900. So we'll wait a moment there for everybody to write in your answer. There was a question, this is Karen, and there was a question that came in here that I wanna just real quickly clarify. Um, Jeremiah, all of your patients are Medicare Advantage at Iora Health, is that correct? They're almost all Medicare Advantage. We are um, part of uh, the direct Medicare contracting, uh, the new initiative that started uh, this year in 2021. Great, thank you for that. Okay, so seeing answers come in and thank you for that. I love talk to each other more. That's essentially what we're all trying to do here. And I know we are at time, it's 1130. So in honoring that, um, I will ask everybody to save the date for July 15th, our follow-up to this um, date, and we'll focus on uh, qual aligned quality measurement. So join us again in July and continue to put your answers up into poll everywhere. We would love to uh, push and challenge and create a healthcare system that works for all of us. So thank you for joining us today. Thanks everyone. And just a reminder that a recording of these slides, um, I'm sorry, a recording of the webinar and these slides will be going out. And then if you are not on either the Bree Collaborative or the Washington Health Alliance listserv, we do encourage you to sign up. And those links are on the last page of that um, save the date slide in the PowerPoint you'll be receiving. And that's where we will be pushing out our registration links and further information about speakers in the upcoming webinars and other good news we have to share. So thanks everyone for being with us and we hope to see you in July.